life comes at you fast and before you know it you've spent 10 years engaged in a hobby what started out as uh, a way of reclaiming a little bit of your life maybe that's the best way to phrase it and then it turns into this massive thing I'm not saying that this is a massive channel obviously it's not um, but as far as when I started getting into videography I, w I was just a a young, a young early 40 something. And I wanted to make YouTube videos. I wanted to make, I was into seriously into ASMR and into writing. And I wanted to combine those things. And I kept looking for reasons, I think, at the beginning to stall to not press that first, that button, that record button, the first time. Let me say hi first to people before I go into this. Hey, Andrew, Deadly Nightshade, on your first stream. Intergalactico, good to see you. Bella, Emily Barnes, good to see you back. Icarus, Pivy, hey, and Amy. Even the PFPs have not changed. Lisa, how are you doing? And Anne Heroes. Hello to you as well. Um, Pivy, this is this is an uh, this is a new room. I'm I've been I'm I'm back was well, new old, right? I'm back in the basement, which is where I started in this house and then I came out of the basement and now I'm back in the basement but so I think when I started making videos the thing that I was afraid right so uh, I spent a lot of time sort of focused hyper focused on the things that weren't right yet you know like uh well, I don't have the right camera. I don't have the right lens. I don't have the right audio recorder. I don't have the right lights. I don't have the right space. I don't have, you know, the right time. I don't have the right sound treatment. I don't have, like, you know, you, you imagine it. I was using it as an excuse um, to delay, right? Letting the perfect be the enemy of the good or the... the Decent. Deadly Nightshade, you've been subscribed since my last stream. You're the only one. My honesty and rawness. Well, that's good to hear. I don't know. Um, I'm just depressed. Just a depressed person. <laughs> Talking into a microphone. Hey, KJ and Hiver. Wow, good to see you guys. Um, it has been a while. So, um, I would, I would kill time, right? I would, I would say, well, I'm not going to do it this weekend, right? Because I got to wait for this thing to come in, right? I gotta order this thing, or I got to wait to save up to get this thing. Um, which, you know, in retrospect, that was just wasted Obviously, that was wasted time. But I did really get into the gear aspect of things. And when I was moving my stuff, um, it became very sort of clear to me that unlike, I think, I think most people, right? I don't want to generalize, but I think probably most people, when they say upgrade their equipment, they sell their old equipment. <laughs> either to offset the cost of the new equipment or, or for whatever reason. I haven't really done that, 
So um, I still have, I have it on a, a table here that you can't see. Go back to basics here, you one camera set up. Um, I also if I had multi-camera setups, then I would have less stuff to show you. Um, I've got a table right here of the cameras, bodies, lenses, and accessories that I've used over the past eight to 10 years. Um, some of which, some of this stuff now is incredibly inexpensive. Uh, I definitely went overboard and was always like trying to at the edge of my whatever I could afford and a few steps beyond that to the detriment of my credit, etc. cetera. Um, trying to read up on stuff as much as I could and get the best X, Y, or Z because that was going to make me better. Of course it doesn't, right? It doesn't make you better. Um, however, you know, there's a, there's a line there somewhere, right? You, you feel, you feel empowered and encouraged if you're liking what you're seeing and hearing the quality of what you're seeing and hearing and you get discouraged if you don't. Now, some people don't get discouraged by that. And that's uh, an ability I don't have. Like for me, uh, I am way too easily discouraged. I can be discouraged by the, the smallest thing, which is terrible, you know. Um, so when I started, actually when I started, my first couple of videos were shot on a camera that I, that I don't have anymore, um, which was called the Sony FS100. It was a box camera. It's similar to like a lot of cameras today, sort of the box format. Um, it was, I think, an APS-C sensor, which I'm going to be talking a lot about like things like sensor size and, and using camera terminology. Feel free to, to shout out if you want me to go into detail on what something is or what it means. Or you can Google it what it means to me, right? Um, so it was an APS-C sensor camera and it was not great. It was, I, I did not know at that time, like the, the idea of fast lenses pro providing, you know, narrow depth of field focal planes so you can get nice sort of out of focus backgrounds. Uh, and decent lighting, like these were things that I did not know were in the consumer market yet. Um, but the FS100 was one of those things that that was. Hey, Nico, good to see you. Um, so that was my that was sort of my first my first camera, which I really liked. The fact I, I was blinded by its narrow depth of field because it had cheap prime lenses but its dynamic range is really really not good at all and its highlight roll off was not good so what i'm shooting right now is a black magic uh, 6k um which is also well it says super 35 which aps-c super 35 those are roughly equivalent sensor sizes but the highlight roll off is really nice on on the black magic cameras um you know, eight years ago, it was it was a much different deal. Um, so that was my first camera. It did not have autofocus, right? Of course. This camera does not have autofocus. I cared about autofocus back then much more than I should have. But you learn, live and you learn. Right? Um, so I, I shot a couple of videos on that camera, but I had my eye, had my eye on... From the beginning, I had had my eye on the Canon cinema cameras, the C line of Canon cinema cameras. Uh, in this case, the C100, which is the only one I could come close to affording. And even that, I had to, you know, take out a line of credit that I paid for a long, long time. But I was finally able to procure uh, a C100 in like 2013. 2014, wait, maybe that's, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 2000, I don't know when that camera came out. Feels like 10 years ago. 
Um, and I still have that camera to this day. I have that camera right here. Boop. And, you know, there are a lot of things about this camera that I absolutely loved and still love and that they don't really do in cameras anymore. Uh, it's not considered a priority, but I certainly miss them. One, the hand grip that it came with and the form factor. Like people think this is a weird form factor. And I remember when I first saw it, I was like, yeah, it is a weird form factor. I don't like it. It's kind of narrows at the top like a pyramid. Um, but actually like for holding, it's fantastic. Like holding like this, it's great. It's great for that kind of running gun shooting. Um, it has built in neutral density filters, which if you don't know what a neutral density filter is, it's essentially like sunglasses for your camera so that you can open up your lens in bright scenarios and still have nice out of focus backdrops or backgrounds. Um, while having your, your lens wide open. Um, this, so what Canon was doing and a, and a lot of other companies as they were going into like the cinema or video market was they were, you know, making sure that you could, this is a stills lens. Right, this is the 24 to 104 uh, F4 stills lens that kind of comes on like the Canon 5D Mark threes and past, you know. Um, yeah, the thing is the size of the old, like sort of eight millimeter or super 16 um, tape handhelds. It's pretty big, but but uh, nothing you can't, you know, like this, that's one of the things I loved about it. Like this, if you don't want the audio, this top piece comes off. Then you have a much smaller form factor. Like this cup was a, actually an aftermarket um, eyepiece cup because it's very hard to use the viewfinder in this is laughably bad, laughably. Um, but it does have a, a, a screen on it, although you cannot see it from the front. You can only see it from the back. So the, those were the drawbacks for this camera were, can't see the screen from the front. When I got it, it did not have autofocus. I sent it back to Canon and they wouldn't do this thing. They would install uh, dual pixel autofocus um, if you paid them and then they would send it back to you, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting. The C100s after this all had autofocus, but this one, when I bought it, did not. I had to add that on. Um, Icarus, we'll get to Fujifilm, um, but it may take a little bit. So this is the camera that I shot probably my first 30 or 40 videos on at least. Um, and I really, really liked almost everything about it. Um, you can see here, like when the lens is off, this is actually pretty small. There's not much to this. You don't even have to have this handheld piece on. It breaks down. It kind of came with its own sort of cage. Like, you know, nowadays most cameras would only come with this central part. Um, and everything else would be an add-on. But it had good preamps. You know, it took XLRs. So I could have nice microphones hooked up to it. Get decent sound without an external sound recorder. I've moved away from that. But... Um, like I said, I had neutral density filters, had a good battery life. I had these big old, I don't remember how to disconnect this. There's a battery release here, yeah. I don't think I've touched this camera for quite some time. Yeah, these big old cameras. You'll see like a lot of cameras now that are DSLRs that look like stills hybrid shooters. The first place they sacrifice is camera, right? or I'm sorry, is battery. They'll just keep like a tiny little stills battery and you get like 45 minutes of operating time, if that. This had a nice chunky battery, lasted a long time. 
Um, and it's shot in log. That was the other thing I really, really wanted and liked was it shot in what they call C log, um, which purported to give you 12 stops of dynamic range. I don't think it did. I think it probably gave you 10 or 11, but um, still was fine. If you're exposed right, um, then it was fine. The codec on this camera sucked though. The codec on this camera was something like 25 megabits a second, and that was it. It was 8 bit. Um, it was just not, and the thing is, like the, this hardware is in a much more expensive version of this camera. This is a C100. The C300 and C500 use the same sensor. Well, the C500 does, and the C300 does. But it has a much better codec. Um, so that's why, like, I think when I look at older videos shot with this, they feel a little mushy and dimensionless. And that's, I think, because, largely because of the codec. You know, lighting too. But, um... A lot of it was just, it was not, the sensor was capturing, the image coming into the sensor was great. The sensor itself was fantastic. Is it 4K sensor that downscales to 1080? It's not a 4K camera, but it was a 4K sensor. Um, what Canon did that was kind of like a weird sort of slap in the face to a lot of people and felt that way to me certainly was like the hardware in this camera was the same hardware that was in the cameras that cost $15,000 and more, but they disabled it, right? So like you're not able to actually use the 4K in this camera. You're not able to actually record a, a nice solid codec. Um, they would, fuzz in my beard, they would hobble their cameras, um, which showed that you know you weren't paying for the hardware. You were just paying for essentially the firmware. Like I would guess that there's, they probably could if they wanted to, and they never would have a firmware update to this camera, which would allow it to record with a much better codec. I think my, my thing is like this camera, you can get now that you can get this camera probably for under a thousand dollars, which is amazing, an amazing price for this camera. You put this camera in wide DR mode and got the dual pixel autofocus and this camera competes with you know pretty much anything certainly for live right and running gun stuff if you have like a lot of uh subtle sort of color variations or luminance variations in a scene that you're trying to make pretty dynamic um that's when like you know you might start to get a little muddy if you look at my uh, first Last of Us video, you can see like I was disappointed with what this camera was doing in that video. Uh, it got to me. Oh, you saw, you saw the beard fuzz. Beard fuzz. Right, get in the center there, dog. Um. So after this camera, with the camera that like a lot of people were using around this time uh, was the Panasonic GH4. And I had a Panasonic GH4. I did, that is one of the ones that I sold. I got rid of. Um, that shot 4K. But it didn't do a lot of things that this camera did. So I really was like waiting for the Panasonic GH5. I want to say came out in 2016, maybe. This is the Panasonic GH5. You can see, like, you know, looks a lot more like a stills camera. To this day, this is probably still the camera that I enjoy holding the most. And I will often, like, still take this out. You can see I've got a Peak Design strap attached to it, which I love. Peak Design stuff. Um, but what the GH5 did was gave you a 10-bit codec shot in what they called V-log, which is the equivalent of, of C-log. Right? Um, 
had a flip out screen that flipped forward. This thing is almost 10 years old and the hinge is great. Everything on it works fine. It's a micro four thirds sensor, which means I actually went down in my sensor size. So you can see it's a pretty small sensor here, but you know, depending on what, it's not really the size of the sensor, it's what the sensor does. What this does lose is you can see this loss like battery size, right? Don't get great battery life out of this. There's no neutral density filters in front of, this is also one of my favorite lenses. This is a 42.5 F1.2 um, Noctocron. It's like a like a glass. Um, but small, right? You could take it with you. You put a good around that time I also invested in this lens, which is also a 42.5, uh, but it's a Voigtlander and it's a f.9. So we go down below f1. Let's see if we can get See that nice aperture ring there, clickless, you get nice smooth. Oh, love this lens and it's built like a tank, everything is metal, even the lens hood. See, I think there's only eight aperture blades in there. It'd be nice if there were more, but it's fine. I had great bokeh. Uh, the point is that like f.9, you put this on this, and you can pretty much you know see in the dark. Yeah. Now, this was right around the time that Sony was coming out with their A7 series where you could boost the ISO like crazy. And so I, at that point I got an A7S. But I never liked Sony colors. I never liked, I never enjoyed grading them. Um, I never saw the image that I wanted to see. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is. I'm sure it's my fault. I don't think it's Sony's fault, but I did go into the Sony ecosystem and that is one ecosystem that I left. Why well, I was in it with the FS100 at the very beginning. Uh, but then I left, came back briefly for the Sony A7S II and decided that I just didn't like S-Log. Um, it just made, made grading no fun for me. Although, you know, the Sony A7S, you can just boost the ISO and uh, totally dark night, you can see. But I felt like I was able to get better images out of a camera like this. It also did like 120 frames per second, which was great. And again, like still to this day, this in my hand is the camera that feels the best to me. And I love the placement of the knobs. There's nothing like physical knobs. This is staying up forever. It's not going, going away at all. Um, and so this fixed a lot of the things for the C100, right? I don't think the autofocus was quite as good as the C100. The C100, which I, as I said, came out like, you know, 10 years ago with its phase to test, detect autofocus, even though the autofocus was only in the center, um, was more reliable than the autofocus in this much newer camera, but autofocus was becoming less and less important to me. I have no autofocus on this camera right now. It's here. Go in and out. I don't really care, right? Like it, I set the, the aperture to like F2.2, I think is what it's set to now. And that gives me enough sort of space here. Or if, I'm, if I'm a little out of focus, nobody cares, right? So anyway, love this camera to this day i love this camera however even at 10 bit 4 422 at 150 megabits per second i think is the 
um, codec that they also, they have, so there are diff different types of codecs, right? So codecs are trying to create manageable file sizes while giving you a nice image, right? There's a couple ways that a codec can accomplish that. One of those is by using what they call like delta frame, right? Like what changes from one frame to the next. If I were to use one of those codecs and I were to just sit here and not move, it's not gonna update anything over here that doesn't move. It's not gonna, it's, not, it's just gonna say repeat that one until it, something changes. The pixel doesn't change, repeat that until it doesn't change. It's very effective, right? It's a very effective way to uh, save space. Um, it's not, it doesn't play so well with NLEs. So once you get it into your editor, uh, it can slow stuff down. Whereas an intra codec just captures, it's like capturing pictures. Every frame is a picture. And a scene where nothing moves at all will be just as big as a scene where the entire screen is moving. So the GH5 had an intra codec, which meant really big file sizes, but it played well with Adobe Premiere. But even that, at 10-bit 422, if I got it right um, in camera, like if I got it right, if I got it so that when I was monitoring it, I was recording, I got it right while I was recording, it was okay, right? I, I, could, I, I was good with that. If I got anything wrong, including the white balance, right, then I was screwed. So my next holy grail from there was I really wanted a camera that shot raw. Log is well and good, right? But I wanted a camera that shot raw. Everything about raw was better. I mean, it's gigantic file sizes, right? Um, but you, know, you get 14-bit, 16-bit raw. Um, it keeps a bunch of the information editable post post production. Change the color temperature, which just can have just a huge, huge effect on an image to the point where, like, often I will when I'm editing an image or a video, or I'll, uh, if I'm feeling a little stuck, I'll change the color temperature a bit just to give myself a fresh perspective on it, even if I go too far, right, one way or the other, and then maybe I'll bring it back, right. Like right now, this image even right now is is too too warm. Really, the color temperature on this image should be um, a couple hundred degrees cooler. But that's fine. I don't care. The point is, I wanted raw. Like that's that's where my sights were set, and I was saving money. I was working, and this is like all I cared about was saving up money for what was for me. I think like overall the best camera that I've ever owned. Um, that, with caveats, but it was the successor to the C100 and it is the C200, which is this camera right here, C200. It doesn't look that different from the C100 the viewfinder is much better. It's much heavier than the C100. Um, I have the top off, but one of the things is they moved the sound, the XLRs to the body um, so that you could have the top handle off and still have XLRs. Let me release this battery. So this camera it's really the same, pretty much same as far as battery life goes. But this camera was a revelation for me. This camera changed everything. Um, you could shoot two modes. You could shoot to SD cards in 8-bit, which looked no better than the C100, but it was 4K. Or you could shoot RAW. 
on to see fast cards, which extremely expensive media because it's a lot of data being transferred. But you could shoot raw. And for me, that was, that changed everything. Still, let's see here. Well, the ND filters are in front of it. Still, it's a Super 35 sensor. It's a 4K sensor, but it actually records 4K and records 4K raw. Uh, this is also one of my favorite lenses. This is the Canon uh, 50mm 1.2, which has a very unique, unique bokeh. Uh, the out-of-focus areas have a very unique look to them. Um, but you can see it's sort of a short, stumpy little lens. You can compare this to the C100. Let's take a look here. C100, this is probably one of the reasons why autofocus is a good thing. C200. Just a little bit sort of shorter and, and longer, but like I said, like significantly heavier. Um, and this is where the CFast card would go. I'm doing ASMR. Opening up that CFast card. But then also you could shoot to SD cards, but you couldn't shoot raw to SD cards. And that's all I cared about was shooting raw. So I was shooting, you know, an hour long video that would take up a gigabyte of space. Um, and that was just like, I would, I would take it into the NLE and I knew like, even, like, just starting looking at it, just looking at the image as I brought it into the NLE and I was like, oh, wow. the possibilities at this point are endless. I, I, shooting it was just the first step in the process of achieving the final look when shooting raw. Compared to shooting log. And I found that really exciting. You know, really um, freeing and inspiring because when I was shooting and there was something that I didn't really like the look of, I knew that, look at the size of that, that lens just all glass. And this did, did have, you know, internal preamps that were very good. But by the time I got here, I was no longer recording my audio uh, in the camera. So what was I recording my audio on? Well, I went through, you know, what most other ASM artists sort of went through around that time. which was, you know, recording to Zooms. The, uh, the H4N, I think, was the, the recorder du jour around that time. But I didn't love the sound quality of the Zooms. Uh, the, the, yeah. Um, they had a lot of self-noise. They had a lot of static. Um, if you pushed them, you were just getting, you were just getting hissing. You know, you were just getting like white noise when you would push them. So I did my homework there. This is actually before I moved to the C200. This is actually while I had, while I was shooting with the GH5, I made this switch. I, cause I had to, because there were no, uh, XLR ins on the GH5. Um, and I looked into what to record to, what had good preamps, field recorders, and the, you know, the company that kept coming up over and over again was sound devices. Sound devices, it's what they use for movies, it's what they use for, you know, commercials, TV, sound devices. And they made a prosumer model of their field recorder. 
which they called the MixPre. So this was the first sound device MixPre that I got. You can see that you know it has quarter inch thread here, so you could actually just kind of like mount your camera on it like that, right? And mount this to the tripod on the bottom. You have it kind of be one unit like that. And that's what I did. And the mix pre sound to me, you know, uh, was splendid. I used it for recording music as well. I was, I'm extremely happy. I'm very glad I found this. I'm using another mix pre right now uh, to go through. That's doing the noise reduction that you may or may not be hearing. Hopefully, you're not hearing noise because I've got the noise reduction going on with mix pre. Um, the upgrade they made from these to the ones that I'm using now is they went to 32-bit float for their uh, their audio files, which is essentially like going raw for audio. So what going raw is for video is what going 32-bit float is for um, audio. It basically means you can't clip it or it's very, very difficult to clip and you can record at a very, very low volume and then bring it up and you're not going to have a lot of noise. Or you can record at a super high volume that you think is clipped and bring it down and everything stays nice and restored. You don't get distortion. Um, both this and the newer version of this Mix Pre have cashmere preamps, which are really good preamps. You can drive them really hard. Um, when I, whenever I'm in the studio or an enclosed area like this, if I'm shooting videos here, I will use the microphone you're seeing now, which is probably my favorite microphone um, for recording vocals, guitar, ASMR. It's a large diaphragm condenser. This is a matched pair. They're AKG C414s, in this case, the uh, XL2s. There's a couple versions of this, and I have uh, the other one, one of the other ones that I used to use for a while. It's a little less uh, crisp. It's got a little more like of an analog feel to it. XLS is the other one, the XLS. Um, but I find for my voice that this is actually better. So I'll use these if I'm in a situation where I know I can be pretty close to the mic. Uh, if I'm in a situation where I can't be close to the mic, I will use a super cardioid mic. I had gone the, the route of the shotgun mics, got a couple of Rode NTG3s. Why did I get Rode NTG3s? Because Massage ASMR got Rode NTG3s. <laughs> I loved his sound quality, and uh, I wanted to mirror it. He also had a C100, I believe, but I got my C100 before he got his C100. So I didn't copy him there. I only copied him on getting the Rode NTG3s. Um, but I did notice that I was getting, in the rooms I was in using a shotgun microphone, was getting some weird sort of standing room noise from behind the microphone because for dialogue when you're in an enclosed space a shotgun microphone is not the best microphone it's actually better to go uh, super hypercardioid so do I, have, I have these mics over here they're not much to look at but i'll grab them anyway just so we can be just so we can be thorough here there's no autofocus, so it's not going anywhere. Well, I'll just bring this whole piece over. Because this was the way that I... Well, I'll explain it once I come back. I gotta unscrew this. I'll be there. I'll be back in a minute. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Almost. Sorry, this is really screwed on. Pre 
tell you, I don't want to drop it. And having said that, I'm probably going to drop it right now. So these are, this is the hypercardioid mic uh, that I would use in situations where I uh, could not be super close to the microphone. They are Audio-Technica, model number is weird, it's like an AT4053B or something like that. Um, and how would I hook these up? Like, well, so a lot of times I would put them on separate microphone stands, you know, and have them sort of at uh, 90 degrees facing the general area where the noise was going. I would always, always have them in these type of shock mounts. Just like I always have the shock mounts can't overstate the importance of shock mounts. But I would also sometimes just put these on this bar. Right, so you only need one. You only need one stand for this, and as long as you're fairly close, this gives you a pretty good stereo image. You, know, you essentially have these mics this far away, pointing at you like this, but you only need one attach point. Right, so wherever they are, I would tighten these, obviously. Um, so if you can get away with that, you know, it makes things easier. If you can't, then you have them on, on separate stands. That's fine too. But these shock mounts, super important. So I remember getting these mics, the sound device mix pre, and just feeling like at that point, yeah, the sound was taken care of. Um, Amy, you didn't know about Dimitri until I brought you up in the last... Did I bring him up in the last, last live stream? Am I obsessed with Dimitri? Maybe. <laughs> Guy's good. <laughs> He's good, and like with so many people lately... Um, I'll probably regret this as soon as I say it, but so many people lately sort of showing the, going mask off and showing themselves to be uh, different than the people they represented themselves as. Uh, I don't think Dimitri, Dimitri seems like a, a good guy. So anyway, my point is, I got rid of NTG3s because of him. Got rid of them. Actually, I kept one. Because for a run and gun situation, it's great to have a, a shotgun mic for that, right? But if I'm doing dialogue recording, I would use these into the mix pre on the C100. C200, sorry. Now, something interesting about all this is when I had my FS100, before I got my Canon C100, I got the lens that I think is my all-time favorite lens that I have ever got, ever had. Now, it's not my favorite lens in all cases, right? Like if I'm just doing like portrait type work, I love this lens. Uh, I love the lens that's currently on my Blackmagic 6K, which is the 85 millimeter version of this lens. Uh, 85L 1.4, I think it is. I, I really like the way it renders color. I like the way this looks, right? Um, but as far as, like, if I could only pick one lens out of all the lenses that I had, and that was the only lens I could ever use, it would be this lens. It's not even a first-party lens. This is a Sigma 18-35 to 1.8. It's a zoom, 18-35 to 35 zoom, with no movement of the barrel when you zoom. It's roughly par focal, and it has a maximum aperture of f1.8, which is amazing, amazing. This lens is going on 10 years old, and I use it more than any other lens, certainly not any other lens combined, right? Because I, I often go for longer focal lengths now. 
Um, so like an 85 millimeter, something I really enjoy. But in cases where, you know, I need a wider lens, I'm, I'm going for the Sigma. Sigma Art 18 to 35, 1.8. When I bought it, I think it was $700, which is not cheap for a lens, right? But none of these lenses are cheap. But the other thing about lenses is you can sell them, right? You could still probably get close to what I paid for this lens and I bought it 10 years ago or almost 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, single favorite lens, Sigma 18 to 35, single favorite camera, Canon C200. We're, we're not through, we're not done with the story yet. Um, definitely favorite, single favorite microphone is the AKG 414. Hey, Hammer Downey Jr. Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, the beard is getting a little out of control. But thank you. Um, be trimming it soon. So, where do you go from the Canon C200? Where do you go from shooting raw, being happy, having good autofocus, having a large selection of lenses, shooting at 4K, which is you know more than you need, for certainly for YouTube. Where do you go from there? What do you do? Well, I started looking at ecosystems. And this is when I started getting interested in live, doing live streams. Canon is not great at ecosystems. Um, not many companies are they they sort of give that short shrift um the company that so somewhere in all these cameras that i had bought i had bought i had purchased a black magic pocket cinema camera that shot raw but it shot raw in a way that was like even though i loved raw it was it was untenable for me they were dng files they were gigantic and they were actually separate frames so like it actually recorded a whole bunch of individual images and then expected your NLE to string them together it was not sustainable I don't think um, it was for the cost and for the there was a lot about the camera that I loved and uh, there were also a few ASMR artists who were using black magic cameras who I looked at and I was like, well, the image is pretty good. And, you know, obviously I looked at non-ASMR artists as well. Um, and I keep hearing all these great things about how they integrate into an ecosystem. So I looked at Blackmagic cameras. And I bought my first Blackmagic camera, which was this right here. This is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K uh, with, a, with a cage that I, I put this cage on if it's not part of the camera. It's ugly. It has no autofocus. It has no neutral density filters. The screen, although large and quite lovely, is there any juice left in this one at all? No. Battery life is horrendous. Um, do I have any of these batteries lying around? I don't think I do. Uh, I'm not going to show you the screen. Huge screen on the back, but not articulating. Just sits there. Um, Plasticky. I don't know if you can... What's metal on here is the cage that I added. A lot working against it, but completely controllable via Bluetooth. Image quality in my opinion, out of this world. It's the image quality you're seeing right now. Um, 
and cheap. Now, cheap is relative, right? This is a, was a $1,200 camera. Um, none of these other cameras were, were that inexpensive. Now, like I said, it does go back to this very small, let's shine a light on it. This very small micro four thirds sensor. So they're very small. But that means that you can get lenses for it uh, that are less expensive. This is a micro four thirds lens. One of my favorite lenses, as I mentioned. Right. And now, bam, you're shooting at f.9, 0 0.9. You're shooting raw. Blackmagic has their own RAW. You're also able to shoot ProRes. And if you're on a Mac like I am, ProRes is like the easiest codec to edit. You can scroll through it like butter. It's nothing. No problems. I'm on an M1 laptop here, a MacBook Pro. Nothing special about it. It will just chew through ProRes like nothing. But even B-RAW, it even handles B-RAW really well. Um, so you're shooting RAW. You have a great ecosystem. The audio, don't even think about the audio. But at this point, I was not thinking about audio. The switcher that it integrates with, I use the Blackmagic A10 switcher. It's got software where you can bring up and control uh, anything about the image live. And the camera is remote controllable. So that's when I was doing live stuff and I would have multiple black magics. I ended up getting three 4K black magics and then I sold one of them and got the 6K, which is what's shooting me right now. Um, the black magic 6K, which is back to a super 35 millimeter sensor, bigger sensor. So it doesn't take these MFT lenses. It takes the the Canon lenses. Let me also call it this is this here like is not a Canon lens. This is a, a Rokinon 50 millimeter 1.5. It's got the gears, which is really important because another thing I did was got to follow focuses. So uh, when I was talking about autofocus not being all that important, it's not important to me anymore because I either don't do it or I have my gimbal do it. The gimbal, which you can't see right now, uh, has a LiDAR attachment that goes on top of the camera. Uh, determines the distance between the LiDAR attachment and the point of focus and literally through a gear system will turn your lens until it's focused. Um, which gives nice sort of cinematic results, let's say. So that's where I went from there, as to black magic. And that's sort of, well, frankly, like when I shoot, if I'm doing live, there's no question it's black magic. If I'm shooting in a studio, I will still often shoot on the C200 in RAW. Um, the C200 in RAW is noisy compared to the black magics. It's noisy compared to like the new C70 and all that kind of stuff, but I kind of like the noise. <laughs> uh, I enjoy a little bit of grit uh, and I find the color and the micro contrast that I get from the C200 to be really pleasing to me and fun to work with. I sometimes find the black magic image to be almost too clean and I have to throw some noise on there. Courses for courses. Right? Anybody have any questions at this point? Before I move on to the next stage of cameras, I'll bring up a couple of other things that I've found super, super useful. So Tiffin makes a bunch of filters. They make variable ND filters for the cameras that don't have built-in ND filters, like most of my cameras don't. 
The, the thing that they make that I like the most is the Black Pearl Mist. It's this thing here. It's almost always usually on my camera. And it just gives point lights some bloom. You're not really going to get the effect here, sorry. Uh, but essentially it's a piece of glass with tiny imperfections in it. It looks a little cloudy when you look through it. And if you have any light sources in your image, it will kind of blur them out and have them uh, be a little softer, uh, a little more dramatic looking. So I really like the black pro mist filters. This is a quarter, you can get them different strengths. This is one quarter, you can get them as high as two. I have a two, which looks ridiculous, but I love it. Because uh, it just looks so, sort of like a, someone smeared Vaseline all over your camera lens. Why would they do that? Don't smear Vaseline on my camera lens. Other things that I've really liked, it's a third party container, but the Rode Wireless Goes. So this is a wireless microphone transmitter receiver. Comes with two, well, it comes with one receiver and two transmitters. So you have two transmitters here in the box. The box is charging. It's out of juice, pretty much. Um, but you can take these microphones and they kind of come with little dead cats that you can either have on or unscrew and come off you can see the mic there you can attach a lab mic to it or you can just use it like this and you know you have two going to one receiver a left and a right bam stereo bam asmr all right so i use those sometimes like especially like if i just want to sometimes I, I will record a bunch of audio even if I don't end up using it, I'll just throw these somewhere. And likewise, like, but for light, and similar to Black Magic, in their ecosystem kind of capabilities, the Aperture Lights. This is the MT Pro. Um, is this one dead? This one might be dead. Is it dead? No, it's not dead. But, um, Here's the MT Pro. It's a great little light. It's got magnets on the, on the back, so you can stick it anywhere you want. Give yourself a little extra kick in the background. That's too much. Uh, but the fact that it's magnetic means you can kind of stick it in some hard to reach places. Uh, has a bunch of pixel effects to it. I like these a lot. I also have the smaller versions, which are MCs. Um, I prefer these, personally. Uh, I find that any kind of sort of rod of light is better than a single point source, generally. Although, you know, sometimes you need a strong point source, right? There is a light hitting me here. It's about 10 feet over there. And it's a Fresnel. If it were not a Fresnel, it would be affecting everything. It would be affecting the book stuff back here. It would be affecting all of this stuff. Because it's Fresnel, I can focus it and just make it sort of hit the side of my face here without affecting uh, the black levels of the rest of the scene. So there you go, right? These are all controllable via an app right now. You know, I have this one just died on me, but the lights that I do have. Well, I'm only using one aperture light right now. I have a very simple light setup right now. Uh, but my key light is an aperture light. And so you can get yourself in position and kind of play with the lights, play with the colors, and, and see what happens. My sort of main light for years and years and years has been this Kino uh, Freestyle which is right now is doing almost nothing. Let's see if I turn it off. Yeah, it's just providing a little bit of a, um, kind of a bluish 
Yeah, I didn't like how orange the shadows were, I think is what I was doing here. I wanted to lighten the shadows and make them slightly bluer. So that's what's happening here. Uh, but this gets quite bright, obviously, if I could turn that up. Uh, turn it off. Put it somewhere in the middle. I think that's where we were. I actually think I like it better there. Eh, let's leave the drama. But the fact that that light is also a good you know, 12 feet away from me, um, it's great to be able to control that stuff remotely. But you don't need any of that, right? You need one decent key light, and you can use almost anything. I mean, one of the lights that I use all the time is a desk lamp. Um, so you can really make them. That's you know was one of my problems. I kept waiting for perfection. I would put stuff off because of that. What a waste of energy and time that was. So I've gone through. To, from Sony to Canon to Panasonic, back to Sony, back to Canon, to Blackmagic. Where else is there to go from there? Well, I'll tell you. What then started to catch my eye was large sensors. So, every sensor for every camera, they have photosites. And those are the little individual areas that collect what is essentially like a pixel of information. And depending on the resolution of that camera and the size of the sensor, determines the size of those photosites. The larger the photosites, the more light you can collect, the less noise, but more, I mean, more importantly to me, the more faithful that color representation can be because you're getting less interference just because of the laws of physics from the adjacent photosites. Um, Katie Ruff, does heat become a factor? So I, I purposefully, when I'm looking at equipment, I make sure that um, they either are sufficient to radiate their heat via passive sinks or that their fans are extremely, extremely quiet or that you can control their fans and turn them off and then I'll just basically like cool down the area I'm working in, turn the fans off while the cameras are running, and then kick the fans on. But yes, I'm, I'm always thinking about heat. Um, most of my lights are LEDs at this point. There was a time when that was not the case. It's not to say that they don't give off heat. They do give off heat, uh, but it's not the kind of heat that you, know, you might worry about. I do, I mean, there's definitely times when, yeah, you know, cameras are coming close to overheating. Um, this key light in particular actually has, has a fan that if it kicks on, you'll probably hear it. Um, you may not. With the noise reduction on the uh, Mix Pre, you might not hear it. I find the noise reduction on this Mix Pre to be incredible. Uh, you have to be careful with it. Sometimes you want the noise, right? You want as much especially with ASMR, you, you, it's like having a noise gate on a guitar. You don't want it to suck out the stuff that, the subtle stuff that you, that you want to have go through. Hopefully you're hearing that. Um, would I consider doing an educational camera set lighting theory type video for those of us who haven't touched a camera for 10 plus years? I, I'm, I'm, a hobbyist. I do have a video. Um, I forget what it's called. Fixing it in post, I think, or something like that. Some snarky title. It's pretty out of date at this point, you know. Um, there are a lot of channels that do exactly what you're talking about uh, that I follow and I like quite a bit. 
Um, but I do find that like where I learn the most is by just fucking around with stuff. You know, for every video that I put out, uh, there are three or four videos that you know, never see the light of day. Uh, but were experiments, you know, that either led me to a video or, or maybe went nowhere, you know. But if you're enjoying the process, right, if you're enjoying the process, then the, it needs to be its own reward. You can't, you can't be doing it for money. Right? It's certainly, you know, Obviously, I'm, I'm quite busy lately, right? But uh, there are other reasons why that may have to just do with something in my brain chemistry as to why I'm not quite as enthusiastic about this stuff as I, as I once was. And maybe I'll rediscover that spark and I just need a little bit of time uh, away. So... <laughs> You got your micro four thirds sensors, like the, like the black magic. You've got your super 35 sensors, APS-C sensors, like the Canons. You got your full frame sensors, like the Sony's. Is there anything else? Turns out, yes, there is. <laughs> no, I can't. I can only do one eyebrow. I can't do anything with this eyebrow. I can just do that. Um, and yeah, I do it way too often and should stop. Well, I recently, so one of the things that I had noticed going through this entire journey right, was um, a lot of the time when I would be grading videos and I would be using starting points, like a LUT, a lookup table as a starting point, a lot of the times I would be using Fuji lookup tables um, or Look of tables, tables that purported to give you a Fuji look. So I started listening to and watching reviews for, and I had been doing this for some time, for a couple of years, for the medium format cameras. Now, medium format is larger than full frame format. So I, here, why don't I bring up a little... A little chart for us so that we can all be clear about what this means. Sorry, saw uh, literally just saw an alert that's from my Ken Cinema Group. I was like, oh shit, what if they just announced something while I'm doing this? That would be what would that be? Who cares? Who cares what that would be? Right? Um, Okay. Just grab a chart. And I can share it with y'all just for a while we're talking about it. Hello. Too big. Here we go. So here are your relative sensor sizes. Um, a lot of like the sensor sizes that you see in video cameras are like two thirds. They might be stacked. Um, but generally they're they're pretty small. Then you have your one inch sensors. So four thirds, the red one, 
micro four thirds. That's the sensors that are in the size sensors that are in the GH5, right? The uh, Black Magic 4K, not the 6K. Um, it's big enough, right? It does the job. It allows you to buy lenses that are not super expensive. Um, it's fine. And then you can see, so APS-C there. And you can see there's like slight differences between APS-C Canon and APS-C Nikon. Um, Super 35 is actually pretty close to APS-C. They don't have it listed there, uh, but Super 35 is there. Um, 35 millimeter full frame is what, you know, Sony, a lot of Sony cameras are full frame cameras. Um, and yet, I don't really like Sony colors, so, you know, what the hell? Um, probably these are just the size of the sensors that you see in here. The size of the sensor that the light falls on to create the image. The size of the sensor in here is the four-thirds, the red one, which is four-thirds of an inch, I think. Four-thirds of something. Um, so the combination of, well, where can you go from full frame and always reading and kind of seeing about this line of Fuji medium format cameras got me very interested in Fuji medium format cameras. Now, the problem was that they had been primarily stills cameras. And they were still stills cameras. They had things like the GFX 50, 50R, 50S, the GFX 100. Um, great stills cameras, useless for video. And then they released, late last year, Fuji GFX 102, which did a few things. It shrunk the body of the GFX 100. It um, got better, better battery life. It it did it did several things. It was much faster. The readout was much faster. The rolling shutter was better. But in my mind, the thing that it did that was so fascinating was added a bunch of video features. So I started watching videos on this camera and drooling over this camera. And guess what? <laughs> it's right here. This is the GFX 102. Now, size-wise, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a chonker, right? Uh, this is a, let me get a more reasonable lens on this. It's a hundred and, what are you doing? 110 millimeter lens that's on there right now. Switch that out. For fifty five millimeter lens. This is much more reasonable looking. Right here. This is the GFX 102. Now let's compare it, just kind of looking at it, to the GH5 and you can see the difference 
has a detachable viewfinder. It has one of the best viewfinders I've ever used in my life. I look through this viewfinder and I wish that my vision was like this viewfinder. I wish I could see the world the way it looks through this viewfinder. Um, but the most important thing about this camera is, of course, at least to me right now, is the sensor size. Let's take a look. We'll compare it to the micro four thirds. So here we go. There's a micro four thirds sensor. See the relative size there. We're gonna be able to hold it at the same time. Well, not with the light, but you probably need it. And there is the medium format sensor. I mean, it looks to me about twice the size. Could fit four of those micro four thirds sensors in here. That is a big old sensor. I don't want to shine the light even directly on it. There you go. Big old sensor on this camera. The stills that it takes are 102 megapixels with a dynamic range that um, I don't even know what happened to that lens. I don't want to leave this lens off here. But you can see even the lenses, like this is just a standard 55 lens and compared to that micro four thirds one, it's just, you know, there's definitely like a girth weight difference. So why do I care, right? And why should anybody care? Again, photosite size, accurate color reproduction, higher resolution without losing, um, without shrinking the photosites the colors and film emulations that come in this camera. I have not, you can see it is kind of like stills oriented. It has, oh, it's not showing up here. If I flip it. Hey, flip. What, you didn't have flip for me? Flip it. It has a kind of readout on the top. Showing things like shutter speed, etc. Oh, beautiful. So beautiful. Anyway, without a doubt, this camera has the best video quality that I've seen from any of these cameras to date. Obviously, takes the best stills of any of these cameras. Um, it's a little slow. The rolling shutter's a little slow as well. I am not sure. I'm doing tests right now. I'm not sure that I would completely rely on this camera for my studio filming. I might still use the C200. It can shoot raw. Uh, but I don't really think I would need it to shoot raw. I think it's at the point where I could shoot using their log profile, which they call F-Log 2, um, in ProRes, which it does ProRes in camera, which is also great. But well, Blackmagic's do it too, but so does it. Um, where I could get what I'm looking for and more. As a stills camera, it's crazy. It's crazy. I will take photos with this that I think are unsalvageable and easily, easily salvage them. Pulling information out of what looks like just complete darkness. And if I don't have the focal length to get what I want because the 102 megapixels are there, I crop in. <laughs> you know, a lot of cameras have like 15 to 20 megapixels. So. 
You, know, you do the math, right? You just kind of crop in like that. You're not sacrificing quality. It's essentially like having an array of four micro four thirds cameras uh, taking a camera at the same time. So I am, I do like the the layout. The ecosystem is mm, it's okay. Blackmagic still sort of has the top seat there. Um, Canon, I think, still has the top seat as far as like an all-in-one raw shooting camera. But I love this Fuji. I love it. And I've used other Fujis. I use the X-H2 um, for video. And I didn't like it. I, it was all right. But it was not worth the sacrifices that I was making. I was getting better images out of, better video out of the... Uh, C200 for sure. Whereas with this camera, I think I'm getting better video out of this. Um, the lenses are ridiculously expensive on this camera. Medium format lenses are super expensive because they have to cover a much wider image circle. These are uh, the, it's the cost of trying to be an early adopter, I suppose. But anyway, that is the, I guess the top level highlights of the equipment that I've used over the past 10 years. I'm sure I've missed a few things. Um, and where I am now, which is honestly probably still using a C200 for a lot of stuff. And for live stuff, sticking with the black magics and for everything else, you know, GFX 102. How have you all been? How are people doing? As I put my lenses back on all these exposed sensors. Been a, it's been a couple of months, I can tell you, personally. Nightmare. Very, very difficult. Kids are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and they have all the respect in the world for... Mothers, uh, fathers. <sighs> can do things that I can't, I, I often feel like I don't have the fortitude to do. Oops, it's the wrong battery here. Pivy, you're doing wonderfully. Yeah, we had something like four inches today. Um, I don't know, it's still coming down last I checked. You know. Katie, veering wildly between states of being. Don't I know it. Sounds fun, but... It's not, is it? I've been thinking a lot lately about um, what happens to our brains as we age. And what that means for how we perceive the world and ourselves and where the joy goes and maybe I'm like looking for a, a, an excuse like why am I this way right I want to be able to say oh it's because you know brain's not giving you the dopamine anymore you're not getting that anymore I want to start a series of videos 
Let's sort of focus on the mundane and make it all about a matter of perspective as far as like what is interesting and what isn't. Um, I want to try and, and this is largely for me, right? Like I want to try and find the joy that I used to find in things that were very simple. It's all about perspective. Right? Well, but it's also about like what, you know, your city is equipped to handle. And also this wasn't expected either. Right? Like this snow kind of came out of nowhere. The third knee pivy. Oh, a second knee replacement. Oh, I'm so sorry. And that stuff's all around the corner for me. Very exciting. Still, you know, chipping away at the classical guitar. It seems to be sort of the one thing that still holds my interest. A modicum of uh, consistency. Icarus. No, I didn't. I wish that I had. I was such a... I was too cool for school, you know, like I, I was such a... A loner. You know, I, I would push away anything that was sort of institutional. I wish I had embraced it. I really do. I wish I hadn't have been so cynical. list of things you wish you had known when you were younger. Yeah, advice to your younger self. You gotta think, like, this is... Like, everybody throughout time has had these thoughts and has wished that they could convey some sort of urgency to younger people and the fact that that's just like an insurmountable barrier, like a, a physiological barrier, not even not a psychological barrier, not a, not a matter of perspective, like literally is a brains are different. <laughs> this is a good question, Pivy. Yeah, what would... You're 75, and we know what it is, right? Like, oh, can't believe I'm like, talking in these terms. The world, the, the world has passed us by. The world is, um, the world as I knew it seems to not exist anymore. Um, horrifying I, I try to live through my kids um, as I can it's just find myself tired all the time and, and not really wanting to do what I need to do to um, to engage I am watching the new true detective I, I liked the first episode. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I loved it, but I liked it. I'm interested to see where it's going. Uh, the Curse, the Nathan Fielder, Emma Stone, Benny Safdie show, that was good. I didn't like the end, but I enjoyed the show. But I'm hoping True Detective is good this time around. Um, 
What do, there were things I didn't like about it. I generally like Jodie Foster. I felt like maybe she was doing a little too much wink and a nod kind of acting, but um, that's because I just want it grim. Right? <laughs> um, Well, it seems like with this new one, um, I wonder, you know, I wonder how it really came about. Isa Lopez, I think, is the one who wrote and directed this series. And I'm, I, I almost wonder, like, uh, although I read an interview where she said, like, she envisioned this as sort of the opposite but counterpart to season one, and where season one was all, like, heat and flat and desaturated and warm and um, warm colors. Hers was going to be, you know, cold and colorful. And whereas the first season was like not really letting you know if it was going to be supernatural or not. Hers was like, no, we're, we're telling you, you know. We'll see. I give everything three episodes. Maybe you're working on a photo essay project about the tarot. Um, what is the perspective? I'd be curious to know that. Um, yeah, what have I been working on with this? You know, this stuff. Just put new strings on this, so it's really, really out of tune. Really out of tune. Your sister recently had a kid. She's almost 10. What can you do as an uncle? terrible person to to ask that um i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to give you any advice that isn't like hackneyed advice you know um have fun with them huh? i've been trying to do any anything that my son gets interested in that is artistically inclined, I'll try and sort of back him up in. Um, you know, he's getting into hip hop now. So sort of spray painted the ceiling of the staircase going down to the basement. She says the lab, big arrow pointed down here come down here and, you know, he writes lyrics and I put a beat down in GarageBand or Ableton and he raps, which, you know, I, I, anything to like engage that part of his brain. Great kid, great kid. So, let's do this. What advice do you have for those of us that have had multiple potential partners but are simply ambivalent to having children? My advice would be don't have children. 
That would be my advice. Um, if you don't feel pretty darn sure that you want to have kids, don't. Um, it's probably part of my nihilism coming through. Icarus, you've been an electric bass player for five years. Acoustic guitar for the first time yesterday, huh? Yeah, I've been I've been playing forever. I'm actually my I had I had what I think was like a flu uh, or the flu. And, and the strangest thing about it was it really really affected my joints. It was hard for me to make a fist. Uh, and it's still like I'm trying to do I'm gonna do this. I got to Look, if we're going to do this, you got to turn off the Noise assist. Now you'll hear some noise coming in. This chair sucks from this. This is not. This is not planned, I promise. Let's go up any more. tremolo to a reasonable place because it's not in a reasonable place right now embarrassing that's what I'm working on I've been working on it for a while I think that could take me a year I really think I could probably spend a year getting that piece in some sort of reasonable shape Oh, I'm sorry, Pivey. Yeah, this is absolutely true. You know, it's hard, right? Like, there's... If you have kids, there are going to be times where you wonder if it was the right move, um, especially when it's difficult. And then they're going to be, there will be a time, you know, where you're, you can't imagine how you, that person didn't exist or what you would be like, life would be like if that person did not exist. You know, I have a, a four month old and I have a 13 year old and I have a nine year old. And, you know, it, it doesn't end and I'm not as present in my older kids life as, as you know as I should be 
Um, it's been very difficult dealing with a newborn for me. Yeah. Stuff. This is, this is not really camera gear talk, though. Uh, is there anything I left out? <laughs> Got another shelf up there. You know, I didn't... Oh, tripods, right? Tripods are a big part, and I've only recently gotten into the, the Peak Design tripods, which are just great travel tripods. I think I didn't trust their heads, but their head the design of their heads is actually great. This is a great design, and very different than most tripods. Um, and I trust it and it folds down to be, you know, nothing. This, you fold up this tripod down the center column and you've got a, a six foot tripod just like that just like that like nothing peak design they do some great stuff and i love their you know peak design I'm obviously not an ad for peak design but you know they're Straps are great. They just just push this piece out. And it's extremely, extremely like you know secure, but push it out, and you can just have these on all of your cameras, these little attachments. And this thing is as strong as a seatbelt. It's not going anywhere. They're um backpacks as well, which are just Lovely. Oh. Hey. Peak Design Backpack. It's one of those ones where you know you turn it sideways and you can access all your stuff from the side. Um, but yeah, it's great. It's got a the attachment here. The, 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 the magnets on the straps very very strong this is the universal holder that I have it on my um, I have it on this one so I'll just use this one for demonstration purposes oops they have their sort of universal attachment you can just slide in well now this is screwed up because I have a thing next to it but the idea is this were not attached this would be much smoother you could have this just like at breast height or something it's just kind of locked in there like that quite securely and you slide it out Take a photo real quick. Slide it out. Should be quite easy to slide it out. Is there a button? Scott, don't talk about stuff. You're not. Oh, yes, of course there's a button. Yeah. So yeah, it's this button right here. So slides in. I knew what I was doing. Slides in. It's locked. It ain't going nowhere. So I thought. Really nice designs. <coughs> Overpriced. Yes. But not, I think, over engineered. And this thing is stable.
plans for the year? I, I can't make any plans. There's too much up in the air right now. Um, oh, wow. One of your colleagues is going to an academic conference with Paul Tremblay. That's great. Uh, his new book, Horror Movie, I think it's called. It's coming out next month. Yeah, I was doing call-ins, obviously, for a while when I was doing the podcast, but not not anymore. Um, I had always wanted that to be, like, a two-person thing. And it just never worked out that way. Um, the other channel is probably, the channel's probably dead, the... Yeah. Beyond the Dumber Tours. I, I don't think I'm going to post there anymore. Could change, though. You never know. Anyway, it was great seeing you all. And uh, I hope to see you all again soon. And I hope you all have a good night.